the origins of Alice and AIML go back to the story of Alan Turing. Alan Turing is considered by many to be the father of modern computer science. And the reason for that is that he made three great accomplishments during his lifetime. First, during the 1930s, before there really were any computers, Turing laid the mathematical foundations for computer science. And the abstraction that he invented, the which is now known as the Turing machine, is still studied by computer science students to this day. Secondly, during World War II, Turing was perhaps the single most responsible person for cracking the German Enigma codes, and that helped Britain prevent an invasion by the German Nazis. During that time, Turing was involved in the construction of the world's first computers, which were used to crack the German codes. Thirdly, after the war, Turing became interested in artificial intelligence. And in 1950, he published a seminal paper called Can Machines Think, which posed a test for artificial intelligence, now known as the Turing test. And the Turing test can be briefly considered as a type of chat, online chat interaction, where the mode of communication is text only. And if you can imagine having a chat with someone online, uh, a stranger perhaps, and after five minutes of conversation, you're suddenly surprised to find out that your chat partner is not a real person, but in fact a computer program or a machine, then um, Turing said, if that happens, you would have to consider the machine to be intelligent. Tragically, Alan Turing was gay, and in 1952, he was arrested and convicted of indecent acts and subsequently given a court-mandated uh, estrogen treatment which from which he suffered many side effects. And in 1954, Alan Turing committed suicide at the age of 42. The next person of historical significance to Alice, AIML, and chatbots in general is Joseph Weizenbaum. Joseph Weizenbaum was perhaps the world's first bot master. He worked at the MIT Computer Science Lab in the 1960s, when computers were quite young, and invented a program called ELISA. ELISA is a very simple chat program with about 200 patterns and responses. Making this program available to the staff in his lab at the time, Weizenbaum reported that he was shocked by a couple of things. First is that some of the people chatting with the program, which was uh, trying to imitate a type of psychotherapist, people reported that they were trying to use the program to actually help them with their real psychological problems. And in fact, there were some psychiatrists who gave serious consideration at the time to using such a program in real psychotherapy. Secondly, some of the people chatting with the ELISA program were concerned when they discovered that Weizenbaum himself, as the bot master, was able to read the transcripts of their chat logs, and they felt that this was some kind of breach of confidentiality. So Weizenbaum's reaction to this was quite interesting. He spent the rest of his career basically criticizing his own work and artificial intelligence in general. Uh, he published a very famous book in 1976 called Computer Power and Human Reason, which was kind of a uh, humanist objection to the whole uh, research project of artificial intelligence. And what's fascinating is that the ELISA program may now be the most famous artificial intelligence program and the most widely distributed of all time. It's hard to imagine now someone inventing a new software program and saying, oh my gosh, uh, this is too dangerous, we have to put the genie back into the bottle. Usually people nowadays when they invent some new program are um, trying to rush off and find some venture capital to turn it into a commercial uh, business as quickly as possible. In 1991, Dr. Hugh Loebner began sponsoring an annual contest based on the Turing test. The Loebner Prize 
has an award of $100,000 and a gold medal for the first program to pass the Turing test. According to the criteria of Loebner's contest, however, no program has yet passed the Turing test. Instead, there is an annual award of $3,000 and a bronze medal for the artificial intelligence that comes closest to simulating human conversation. I first heard about the Loebner contest by reading a story in the New York Times in 1991 about the first annual contest. And although I was working in a totally different field at that time, I was struck by the fact that none of the programs came close to passing the Turing test. But the one which is, was awarded Most Human Computer was based on the old ELISA Psychiatrist program. And when I was a graduate student during the 1980s, I had been taught that, if anything, the ELISA program was a kind of research dead end. In other words, um, people believed what Weizenbaum had written about his program, and that the whole problem of natural language understanding was much more complicated and that maybe if we spent a hundred years working on something very, very complicated, we might have a program at the end that could converse about some limited domain such as airline reservations. But in 1991, a programmer named Joseph Weintraub had expanded the ELISA program and won the first Loebner Prize. I'm including Tim Berners-Lee in the story of Alice, uh, AIML, and chatbots because if there was any real technical advance between the days of Joseph Weizenbaum and Eliza and the chatbots of today, it was the invention of the World Wide Web. Basically, the World Wide Web enabled us to create chatbots and make them available to a huge audience of people. And by chatting with a very large number of people online, we were able to collect an enormous log of conversation data. Without that log of conversation data, it might well have been impossible to create bots of the sophistication that we have today. So bot designers owe a debt of gratitude to Tim Berners-Lee and all the other creators of the World Wide Web. Once we began collecting conversational data on the web, our attention was quickly drawn to the work of George Kingsley Zipf. Zipf was a contemporary of Turing, although a far less tragic story. George Kingsley Zipf was a researcher at Harvard in the 1940s, and he was interested in the distribution of words, letters, and phrases in language. So Zipf would actually uh, hire roomfuls of workers whose job title was computer. And what these computers would do was, would be to scan through documents such as an issue of the New York Times and count the frequency of words. What they discovered was that certain words and phrases occur much more frequently than others. And there's a particular type of distribution over these words and phrases. If you count up all of the words in an issue of the New York Times, and create a histogram, then rank that histogram so that the most common word appears first, such as the word a, uh, followed by the word the, followed by for, and, if, by, and so on. The shape of that distribution, according to Zip, has a particular form, which follows a 1 over x function. And Zip said that if you plot these distributions on a log-log scale, you should see a straight line with a slope of minus one. Now, of course, if all the words and phrases were randomly distributed equally in the language, then that curve would be flat. So a characteristic of human languages is Zipf's Law. Zipf's Law has tremendous significance for the creation of bots. Because if we were all poets uttering original lines of Shakespeare with every phrase or sentence that we said, the chatbot programs would never work. But in fact, people behave much more like robots than we would like to think we do. People tend to say the same things over and over again, which they have said before or heard other people say before. So although the number of combinations of language used in everyday conversation is quite large, 
it's not astronomically large. For this observation, we owe a debt of gratitude to the work of George Kingsley Zipf.